especially to you because you've come on time. I know people will stroll in in the middle and I value your time. Uh, we made you wait for eight minutes, I'm sorry about that. Um, I'd like to start right away by uh, asking uh, Mr. Deve Gupta, our advisor, to introduce Manish Chalana, the speaker. Good evening, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce Manish, who's also a very dear friend. We were together in Masters of Conservation, so I know a few secrets which I'll not reveal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, besides him being a friend, he's also uh, an adjunct professor at the University of Washington in Department of Architecture and Landscape an associate professor also at the same university. But beside that, he's also a founding director of Center for Preservation and Adaptive Reuse. And of course, he's published several, several articles, even publications on urbanism and bringing a bridge between urbanism, historic preservation, planning. So a real intellectual, and we all look towards him for guidance and uh, many things that uh, we find difficulty in explaining sometimes in either urban design or preservation. So we will look forward to hearing him. Over to you, Manish. Thank you, thank you, Devet. Uh, thank you, Mavika. Thank you, everyone, for, for giving me this opportunity. You can hear me fine, right? OK, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, my association with Intec goes way back when we were in grad school in, uh, uh, what was it, they were 1994. And we were doing the Delhi listing at that time for NTAC as students, as poor students who were given 50 rupees to go list, find a building somewhere hidden and document it. So that was my for first foray, if you will, into uh, the non-high styled architecture. Because obviously the, the, the listing in Delhi, Delhi listing is, uh, documenting places that are missed by the, the, the preservation bureaucracy. So these are non-high style buildings. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be returning here to be talking about uh, similar themes today. And I, I, I titled my talk, uh, Con Continuity and Change, Valuing Everyday Places in Conservation Practice. Again, it's a very broad uh, uh, sort of uh, framing of, uh, of vernacular heritage. So bear with me, I'll go over and explain some of the ter terminology in the way I'm understanding it or I'm using it in my work. And, and then, uh, sorry, my phone never rings. It, let me. Okay, I hope it doesn't ring again. Okay, so continuity in place, valuing everyday places in conservation practice. I was saying that I, I've, I've framed it rather broadly. I'll start by explaining some of the terminologies for you, uh, partly because I want to clarify where I'm coming from in, 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 in this realm, and then we can, we can go from there. I'd like to leave enough time for Q&A or discussions because that's where I think the most interesting contents get, gets discussed. So uh, I'll not use too much of the time. Uh, I don't even know what time has been allocated for me, so I'm, I'm assuming 45 minutes, so let's start. So I begin with an example of an everyday place. Uh, everyday places uh, have essentially evolved in time through use and appropriation and inhabitation. Uh, they exhibit vernacular forms uh, and are defined, generally defined by what they are not, right? They are not high style. They are not formal, they are not monumental. So we still don't have a very good vocabulary of understanding what, what these everyday places are. Uh, so essentially, scholars have uh, argued that everyday places are essentially non-pedigreed places. Those places that have evolved without the consultation of experts uh, and, in, and they're broadly considered vernacular. Uh, so the vernacular is a broad umbrella and within vernacular, I like to understand vernacular as this larger framing, and within vernacular, there are two uh, smaller boxes, if you will. Uh, one of those is what I call the tra traditional slash folk, and the next, the other box is the everyday or the ordinary. 
So I'll, I'll come to that. Uh, but the phrasing or the terminology vernacular is just broadly used as a catch-all phrase for traditional folk, everyday, ordinary type of uh, places and architecture. The image that you're seeing here uh, is from uh, Architecture Without Architects, uh, which is uh, uh, it's a short introduction to non-pedigreed architecture by Bernard uh, Radatsky. Uh, and it is, it's gotten a lot of press since it's published. It's also been exhibited in MoMA in, in New York. It was originally published, published in 1964. Uh, it provides a demonstration of the artistic functioning and cultural richness of vernacular environments. Uh, so, and and it, is, it also goes into the, how, these, how these places are co-produced without the guidance of an expert or an architect or a planner. Uh, so they are essentially built by the people incrementally, spontane spontaneously, iteratively, uh, based on a common heritage and experience and general understanding of the word. I think you're all familiar with all this. Uh, a point that I want to note here is that this form is often restricted by or constrained by environmental determinism, right? So you say, people argue that, you know, this is probably the most functional form that would have emerged in this part of China, where the dwellings are buried and the fields are, you know, uh, so it's subterranean dwellings and, and, uh, and all the other sort of farming and production happens outside. Uh, so people say that, you know, in a, in a climate like this, perhaps this was the best vernacular form to have evolved, and that's fine, that's all right. But that definition is a little bit restrictive uh, because, uh, uh, because, you know, uh, it takes away the agency that people have in shaping their own environment. So there's another dimension to it. Of course, there's the environmental determinism, but there's also, you know, creativity, agencies, culture, traditions, rituals that people bring in shaping the places, uh, their places. Uh, uh, so I'm going to define some of the terms. First, I'm going to talk about vernacular as, sorry. I'm going to talk about vernacular as folk or traditional. Uh, like I said, often traditional and vernacular are used interchangeably, but I see vernacular as a meta framing that contains folk traditional, folk slash traditional and everyday slash ordinary. So I'm going to talk about folk slash traditional. Uh, traditional architecture is a type of vernacular architecture of pre-modern societies. It's largely self-built. Uh, it's usually in non-urban settings, and it's deeply uh, regional. Uh, so, for example, the traditional architecture of Rajasthan is obviously going to be very different from the tra traditional architecture of Kerala. Both very distinct forms of regionalism and, and traditional architecture, uh, but not very similar. In fact, the traditional architecture of Rajasthan might have more similar similarities with the traditional architecture of Ukraine. So it, it really it depends on how, in what latitude, uh, these these uh, forms have emerged. Because, like I said, they're one they're clearly environment and responding to the environmental constraints that they have, and the the availability of local materials and such. However, much of the vernacular studies have dwelled on this piece. They haven't dealt dwelled on everyday slash ordinary. They mostly dwelled on uh, traditional architecture, often using romantic lenses, uh, fetishizing people and places, you know, often sort of seeing them as quaint representations of a bygone era and fussing with, you know, uh, and wanting them to be frozen in time, fussing if the community wants to change the hat thatched roof and replace it with something that doesn't need a lot of maintenance and skill perhaps they would fuss about it. And they would say that would take away from the vernacularness of, of that place. Uh, so, so that is how conservation is seeing it. It's seeing these uh, as quaint sort of artifacts uh, from, from a different time and place and wanting to preserve it as such. So uh, moving on to, you know, and, and like I said, uh, regionalism is, uh, vernacular is part of a region. So let's just dwell a little bit on the region. Anything that is true to its region or is reflective of the region uh, can be termed as, as regional. In architecture, it's a concept that is held in time in, in, uh, in was held in place until the time of modernism, if you will, right? Uh, and modernism, as you know, is critiqued for valorizing placeless 
architecture through international styles. So that's when regionalism starts getting dented and, and sort of it doesn't quite go away. It morphs and evolves into, into different forms. I show you an example from the Grand Trunk Road in Punjab. Uh, the, the, architect, the architecture along this road in Punjab uh, interprets the high Mughal style prevalent in the major urban centers of Delhi and Agra, right? But it interprets it into more modest provincial variations resulting from, you know, availability of construction material uh, because Punjab had uh, a lot of uh, rich, rich clay. So they, instead of using stones, they used Lakhari bricks. Uh, and, and much of these regional Mughal architecture that uh, evolves at that time uh, obviously is reflective of the availability of local materials, but also the tastes of local patrons, as well as indigenous arts and crafts and skills found in the region. And this I'm quoting Abba Koch. She's, she's looked into this also in 1991. Uh, so they would create simple, basic brick structures, as you see. This is the milestone, Coast Minar, and there's a uh, old uh, sarai in the back. Uh, so much of it, like I said, uh, was used bricks, and it might have been it was actually plastered with lime mortar, uh, and uh, and it sometimes displays, displayed glazed tiles on the facade, which is the Persian influence, but sandstone and marble that you saw in Delhi and uh, Agra, which were more commonly used in cities, were rarely used in Punjab. So that's the prov Punjab provincial of the, of the Mughal style. There are, of course, exceptions. Uh, there's one sarai there uh, whose patron was Noor, uh, Noor Jahan, the empress herself, right? And this is the uh, Amanat Khan Sarai. Uh, and she, uh, of course, you know, used a, a form that is not vernacular, not regional. It's very high style Mughal from, which could be found in Delhi or Agra, right? As, as, a, as a way to flaunt her power and control uh, over a, a masses that were far removed from the capital, right? So, uh, there's an idea that has more recently emerged, more, not more recently, but in the last three, four decades. Uh, it's called critical regionalism, right? So critical regionalism is an approach to architecture that strives to counter the placelessness of modern architecture, which lacked you know, in any identity other than international style, which could be anywhere in the world. Uh, but it, at the same time, also rejects the whimsical ornamentation of postmodern aesthetics and uh, uh, architecture. So it's saying, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, this bland modern creations, and it also doesn't have to be this pastiche of styles where postmodernism, you, you know, you take, take different styles and put it on the facade to harken back to a time and place. Uh, so they're, they're talking about, you know, creating architecture, mostly modern architecture of the region that is rooted in place uh, without sort of, you know, uh, ostentatious display of uh, historical elements. Uh, Frampton gets the credit for this term, Kenneth Frampton uh, for giving us the term critical regionalism, but, but its, its origins go back even further uh, than that. So that is uh, moving into what, how I'm seeing every day in ordinary. Um, I see this category of vernacular, which is outside of the folk or the traditional. Uh, so it's, you know, there is, there is high style here, the Taj Mahals and the major buildings, and then there is this traditional folk architecture, and the rest of the bulk of the built environment is what I, or the scholars call every day, which is just there, right? It's abundant. It's, it's really what, what surrounds us. And why should we be interested in it? That's the first space, not only as uh, conservationists, but also as urbanists. Why should we be intrigued by that? Uh, because, like I said, every day is a type of vernacular uh, that constitutes the bulk of the built environment. It's, it, it's abundant, so it's taken for granted. There's no panic or no crisis in going, you know, looking for it and trying to see how we can manage them. Uh, it's sometimes self-built, but not always. It's inspired by uh, existing trends and catalogs and, you know, what the neighbors are doing. Uh, it's always utilitarian slash functional. Uh, and aesthetics is a part of the equation, but it's not the driver. So it certainly is, you know. And both the academy and practice uh, have underappreciated and undervalued, uh, you know, uh, 
these everyday places. It's sort of the curse of the ordinary. Uh, uh, so here's what I'm going to give you an example from my city in Seattle uh, to sort of you know anchor this point that I'm making. And I, I understand re the context here is very different. And something like this may not ever play out in this context. So what you see here is a block in Seattle, which is 500 block of pine, that was torn down for new development uh, you know, in, uh, I want to say 2007. Yeah, 2007. Uh, the whole block was demolished to make room for a much larger building because this, this, re this neighborhood had been upzoned. Uh, so as you can see, the block housed an eclectic set of small and local businesses in a series of brightly painted uh, spaces. It included bars, restaurants, shops, affordable housing, and such. Uh, the developer buys it and demolishes it, but after that, the Great Re Recession happens in the U.S. and the world. So it just the property just sits there empty for three three years, uh, and and that's when a lot of movement around this everyday sort of block uh, sort of coalesces, uh, and and finally, what you're seeing here uh, is is the residents holding a, a memorial for the block. Right, so you see this. This is a projection on a on a screen. So they all get together. Uh, two art, you know, artists uh, recreate the block on on canvas, not on canvas, on on a screen, and they pay tribute to the block. And they uh, and then they start gathering oral histories around the block. And there was a whole movement around that that led to the creation of a conservation district in this area, which I'll talk about later. So it had it was sort of spurred a movement. This particular uh, uh, event, if you will. And there's a long story, so I, I don't have time to get into it. Uh, so what, it, what I'm trying to say here is that, obviously, as you can see, they are clearly not lamenting the loss of buildings, per se, brick and mortar, right? But they're, but they're sort of you know, uh, missing their association with, with these structures and spaces. Uh, and their memories uh, around those. So uh, these types of places are recognized in literature as uh, generating everyday urbanism. You might have heard about it. It's uh, Margaret Crawford's word. It's an approach to urbanism that finds its meaning in everyday life. So the meaning is critical here. Uh, contrary to new urbanism, everyday urbanism is not concerned with the aesthetics, but with specific activities and the performance of life, if you will, day-to-day -day life, the act of living. Uh, so the, this is a concept. It's you know, it's uh, the idea of everyday urbanism has roots in cultural geography. It's not not new. Uh, uh, you know, stalwarts such, you know such as Jane Jacobs, Stilgo, others uh, have given us the vocabulary and tools and methodologies to understand these everyday places, right? Uh, and they have made an excellent, excellent case for why we should value these everyday places. Uh, so we really don't have to reinvent those wheels. All that work has been done for us. Uh, they've given us definitions, methodologies, methodologies and such to understand these places. Uh, in fact, the next generation, the newer generation of cultural geographers post the 1970s have also given us critical lenses uh, of race, gender, class, caste, sexuality, and such, through which we can understand these everyday places. Uh, uh, of course, uh, these are Western theories, uh, which would need to be contextualized and adapted, uh, uh, or tested, if you will, uh, since we may not have homegrown models, theoretical models, to understand these places. We don't have to reinvent the wheels. If we're really looking for tools to understand these places, those are available. Uh, I mean, it's, it's fine to be critical of these Western imports, and you should be, and I should be as well, but not without fully understanding their relevance in a different context, right? Uh, I'll quickly gaze through this, through an example that you're all probably familiar with, to see how a, a Western idea of, for an everyday place can be contextualized and can produce some results in, in, a, in a totally different context, right? Because as you can see, all these, all these scholars are, are based in the West or were based in the West when they were alive. Uh, 
So you know Patrick Gerrys. He was a major proponent of everyday places, regionalism, uh, way before it was even a thing, right? So, and he was dismissed by colonial planners, including Lutyens. Uh, he was essentially arguing for a shifting focus of architecture, uh, you know, which you can which you can argue that is still not quite happening yet. So you can see here what he's saying. Uh, you know, uh, architects, you know, they become so satisfied with their own stately perspectives, right? So they're not really looking beyond the grand and the beautiful in the, in the environment, right? And they continue to sort of, you know, draw their inspiration from majestic and states and, and institutions. So essentially the bulk, they're not really seeing any value in, in the non-grand uh, places that are that are around them, so he's he's also arguing, you know, against viewing spatial organization as separate from social relations. So he's saying, you know, spatiality and sociality are inter interlinked, and to understand a place and how it functions, we'd have to do both. You can't do one or the other. So it's the same idea as urban form that Lafave gives us. There's form morphology, but that form is de determined by sociology. And to understand morphology, you absolutely have to understand sociology. So the intersectionality is where you'd find interesting understandings and meanings of those places. Uh, you can do one or the other, and they would, of course, yield information. But bringing them both together would be very meaningful. So Girish also gives us methodologies for neighborhood revitalization in the 19th century. And this is the one that he develops in Edinburgh, in the old town of Edinburgh, which was essentially uh, had a, you know, was slum-like, plagued by poverty, overcrowding, squalor, you know, right here, squalor and disease. And it was marginalized by planning and uh, policy makers. It had been described as the Calcutta uh, of, of, uh, of Europe in terms of density and spatial complexity, uh, as well as sanitation issues. Uh, so the city, of course, was using top-down instruments to clear up these, these places, and, and Giris could not get the city to see otherwise. So he and his wife moved into the slums and bought an, a, a James Court. They used their own money, and then they uh, used the methodology of uh, diagnostic service, which you can read about, and, and conservative surgery to sort of revive those neighborhoods. Because again, he was seeing value. He was seeing value in the traditional patterning of land and ways of sort of living. Uh, and while the city of Edinburgh really wanted to tear everything down. So he brings those ideas and tests it for India in many places, right? You're seeing it in Madurai here. He's done it in other places where he's used some of the same ideas that he developed in Edinburgh and tested in India to sort of, you know, value and respect the regional or the local or the vernacular or the folk, whatever you want to call it. But because he essentially, you know, his, his, his vision vantage was not, Elite, and he wanted. He he argued for an equitable city where the underclass residents. He saw the underclass residents of the city as integral to the city func city's functioning. Uh, but modernism from the early 20th century has undervalued all these lessons in favor of uh, approaches uh, that have completely transformed in the way we think about land, and 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 the built right. Uh, also around this time, the, the professions of architecture and planning were both professionalized. MIT started the planning program in the early 1900s, and Harvard started architecture, and everything was then, you know, the control of shaping the built environment was taken away from the people, and it came into the hands of the professionals, and it was then regulated through licensing standards and all this major bureaucracy. So even if you wanted to build your own places, you could not. And, and they were you know, with technology of construction materials and uh, machinery, the transformation of, of these kinds of everyday places around the world was phenomenal, you know. And more, for more, 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 more often, uh, modernists used the tabula rasa approach, where they would go and bulldoze the entire area and recreate, refashion the area based on their uh, modernist vocabulary. Uh, so, you know, you can see here an example from Scully Square in Boston, uh, which, you know, the upper image is what the Scully Square looked like before 1960s. Uh, major urbanists called it, you know, really interesting place, dense, had the vibrancy of cities in Europe, right? And uh, it was also, uh, had started off as an ethnic Italian neighborhood and 
had sort of become a little more gritty and grungy, but the city erased it and created the new, the, you know, the, the city um, center in its place. And you can see the modernist vocabulary of a lot of hardscape, right? And they do maintain, as you can see, the, the original arteries. So they do maintain some elements of the urban form in its recreation, which, you know, uh, it is, but this site continues to be very divisive among Boston folks. You can read online how people are still debating on the loss of Scully Square as well as a place that is hardly used because it gets too hot in summer and, and too cold in winters in Boston. Uh, uh, so such transformations, such as the Scully Squares, are rampant world over, right? Uh, at the cost of everyday places, I believe Vikas Dilwari also spoke here for in, as part of these series about, about such architecture. I quickly show you a, a couple of examples from the mill comp compounds from Giringau, uh, which used to contain factories and chawls uh, in a complex social and spatial network. What giddies and everyday folks, everyday urbanist folks would really, would really have appreciated, because not only do they create an interesting urban form, but they also create spaces and opportunities that could lead to equity and spatial justice, because it's, the city is not just for elite, it's for all types of populations. Uh, uh, and this is increasingly important because as, as, as you have already noticed, the 21st century cities are increasingly inequitable. And the gap between the haves and the have-nots is continuing to rise. And in the next 40, 50 years, the world is going to be even more uh, urbanized than it is now. Uh, so the modernism of Scully Square, uh, looking at what's happening in Giringau, the modernism of Scully Square was still contextualized. You saw it, right? It responded to the site. It responded to the existing circulation. You know, so a greater degree of site response in terms of conditions and constraints. But the most, the third wave of modernism in in the world uh, is, you know, the global modernity is powerful and relentless. Right, it just, Girangao, as you can say, is being transformed, and Gurgaon also, for that matter, is being transformed. You know, under dictates of global capital, uh, and uh, using failed ideologies of uh, global modernity, that essentially furthers large-scale modernist planning theories, and uses abstract, uh, hyper-modern and super-modern forms. You know, which is often sort of related to creating places. Uh, uh, non-places, if you will. So this, this kind of massing you can see, uh, you know, Korea is probably turning in his grave because he, he writes about how why the glass tower is such a bad idea in the Indian context. But in any case, this kind of form can exist anywhere. It doesn't have to be in Mumbai. It can be in Shanghai, New York, anywhere. Uh, so like I said, it's, it's very, very, I mean, this is so forceful that the sec second wave of modernism that arrived in India post-independence, all the early modernists in the country, like Reval, Doshi, Korea, Kanvinde, and others, Reval, you know, they had time to sort of indigenize that modernism. And this was partly because of the constraints we had at that time in terms of technology and materials, but they really, really created, they embraced modernism and created their own brand of modernism, if you will, in the Asia village and other places. But the global modernity is, is, doesn't allow for anything like that. Uh, and it is, it's quite forceful. Uh, so we are cleaning, with or without global modernity pressures, we are cleaning up uh, lots of places to, to sort of reprogram or reimagine our, uh, our landscapes according to nationalistic ideals or, or you know, municipalities wanting to create more sanitized spaces. And much of these everyday places, of course, as you can understand, are not protected. Uh, by, by any conservation legislation. And there's no, by no means I'm saying they should be. That's just a point that I'm, I'm noting. With, you know, you know the case of Varanasi uh, with, and I don't have to go into this Kashi Vishwanath corridor problem, but it, it is really, really, it is a stock of everyday places that people found meaning in, lived in, valued, and had lots of association with, as you saw in the 500 block of Pine. Uh, so if we think as collectively as a group that this is a problem, then we need to have a discussion. But if we really think this is fine, this is how uh, development should unfold, then there's really not much to talk about 
uh, because then these are scapegoats for a reimagining of, of our futures. So I think it's still a point for pause, and, and at least if nothing, it's, 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 a, it's a space for conversation. Um, so in conservation practice, uh, and now I'm switching to conservation practice, conservation practice you know, disparately values the high style and the everyday, right? Uh, so if compared to high style, uh, I mean, compared to traditional, they would value high style. Uh, and much of the resources, expertise, everything is funneled into that, uh, obviously, uh, and at the cost of uh, the, the traditional. But when it comes to the vernacular piece, uh, they value traditional more than every day. Right? Conservation does, you know, uh, when conservation focuses on the vernacular, they tend to dwell more on the traditional types rather than everyday types of vernacular. Uh, and this is in line with the values established by vernacular uh, uh, architecture studies and through association to conservation studies, where practice has mostly sort of, you know, looked for the extraordinary and the ordinary, like finding pr pristine and quaint and nice examples in, in a very broad category. Uh, and, they, and they've done what, you know, Paul Murdoch does in, in Ladakh, you know, uh, painstakingly documented these, uh, these places, uh, often viewing them through romantic lenses to gaze at the pre-modern societies in, in non-urban settings, right? So, uh, so world over, you know, this is happening, is not just in India. Uh, the folk receives more attention than, than vernacular, sorry, than the, than every day, and, and there are multiple methods on ethnography and field methods that, that can be used to document this, this type of environment. Uh, there has recently been a renewed focus on the traditional within the category of vernacular. Uh, lots of projects are happening. Of course, you can argue that they are more site specific and uh, the work of uh, Ashwarya Tipnis, Gurmeet Rai, even Praline, and others in Punjab, Delhi, and Rajasthan, and many others, including in tax efforts, have all demonstrated an increasing focus on, on traditional and to some degree even every day. Uh, um, and, and, you know, the Ahmedabad uh, World, UNESCO World Heritage City document, uh, uh, sorry, uh, designation is, uh, is a testimony to that, that we have sort of shifted our practice and looking beyond uh, the monuments and site framework. Uh, and and uh, these places, in addition to having historic values, are also valuable in the post-pandemic, I shouldn't say post-pandemic, in, in the, uh, what is the word? Continuing pandemic uh, <laughs> uh, years, but it's also, you know, in, 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 at the time of climate, in the era of climate change, we're all talking about or hearing about sustainability in built environments. And many of these places are inherently sustainable, right? They have high density. Uh, they have a very good walking score, right? You can walk anywhere. They offer multiple uses. They are relatively more affordable than other places, and they are also more diverse places. So they are into, in that sense, they are, they are already you know, imbibing some of the characteristics of critical regionalism and new urbanism, whatever you want to call it. And, and they are sustainable places. Again, I'm not saying these places don't have problems. They, they have, some of them may have problems of infrastructure and other types of things, but these places, like Patrick Giddies would say, you know, use an approach where you look for what works, what doesn't work, before you come up with your programs and policies, and whether or not it, it, engage, it should engage conservation or not, and the degree to which it should. Uh, I have furthered these arguments for appreciating local ways of doing design and planning through my work, through a couple of edited volumes. The, one, the first one, Messy Urbanism, uh, Understanding the Other Cities. Uh, that essentially illustrates the physical, social, and cultural aspects of, of, of sort of places in Asia, which, are, which have evolved through a non-Western uh, ideology, and, but which are often dismissed by planners architects as well as conservationists as broadly messy. Uh, so there is, you know, what we're arguing through this work is that there is order in this disorder. Apparent disorder has a lot of complex order if you just have the time and energy 
to to sort of find that. And and even Patrick Gillis said in his work that you know the approach that he was giving was proposing was very time consuming. You know, it takes more time, it takes more effort, more money. And 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 he said the Brahmins and the pundits at that time, or another phrase, were not used to sort of generating so much data from the side because they were not used to the orders, tension, and everything that was happening at that time. So yes, this this is a lot of painstaking efforts to find value in these places. Uh, but these places, the messy places broadly, are stigmatized and devalued by the elite who hold power over the built environment, right? So in this, through this work, we're just questioning the colonial framing uh, of planning. And through this other work, heritage conservation in the post-colonial uh, post -colonial India, we're also sort of, you know, questioning the colonial framing of heritage, you know? And despite its many advances along many different threads, it continues to sort of hold that framing in the way we understand heritage and in the way we manage it and devise policies for it. Uh, uh, I'm going to go very quickly give you a couple of examples from around the world so we can wrap up and have a discussion. So multiple cities around the world have been struggling with their so-called folk slash everyday uh, architecture or places. This is largely, you know, cities in Qatar, especially Doha. Uh, as you can imagine, much of the hyper growth in Doha is only 60, 70 years old, right? After the discovery of oil in 1950s. Before, before the discovery of oil, this was entire Misharab was what Doha is today. It was a small vernacular, not even a town, right? Uh, so you can see Misharab was a vernacular city, and in the last 50 years, the modern metropolis, a hyper-modern metropolis of Doha is engulfed it, right? Uh, Misharab, as you can see, was ve exhibited very traditional forms, uh, you know, uh, in its organic layout, low density, desert architecture, architecture using shaded ac access ways, small openings, breezeways, wind tunnels, and such. There's a whole lot of literature on desert architecture that's used in, in the formation of Misharab, and also privacy, because it's a very gendered space, right? And, and Islamic motives that are also uh, part of this. So once Doha gets all this uh, oil money, uh, they don't know what to do with Misharab. So Misharab then sort of you know, evolves from this folksy, traditional place to more everyday place. You have you know, more in the 1960s, 70s, you have regular businesses that come in and it, it becomes like a more real space. Lots of immigrants, especially from in South Asia, settle in Misharab because there were opportunities for uh, you know, affordable uh, real estate there and, and rentals and such. Uh, so in 2000, I believe, I, I hope, hope I have the date right, uh, the government of Qatar acquired all the properties of Misharab right, through a compulsory purchase order and then transferred them to Misharab uh, properties, which is a subsidiary of Qatar Foundation, which does heritage work in the city. Uh, so they devised a mixed-use development that includes residential, commercial, cultural, and retail spaces. They claim that the project has provisions for affordable housing. I haven't checked that. Uh, I doubt that. Uh, but they do have some rental units at sub subsidized rates. And of course, you know, a project like this where you buy the entire uh, parcel of uh, what is now downtown, you can expect displacement and disposition, uh, dispossession happening, happening there. Uh, uh, so here's what they do. I don't have a plan, but they, but, they, but they retain four homes in the entire district that you saw, right? Uh, and they call it historic zone. And, and, and these four homes are also, you know, and they conserve the traditional homes, but if you read closely through their verbiage, these homes are also extensively recreated, right? So you're not, you're not going to find original fabric. You're going to find the original form in new, new, new material, which is one way of doing conservation. That's fine. So within those four homes of the historic zones, uh, you know, they interpret the various facets of Qatar history through displays and signage and such. So that's it. And outside of it, they've created an entirely new neighborhood you know, uh, so they had erased the old Misharab and created a new neighborhood using vernacular morphology in a contemporary scale, 
right? Uh, so you can see deep, deep covered walkways that are essential. You can see sun shielding elements. Uh, you can see desert architecture and aesthetics, as well as community spaces uh, displaying Islamic motives and imagery. Uh, you can also see courtyards, and uh, this is what Nisharab looks like. You know, there's, uh, I, I see it as a contemporary vernacular uh, uh, because there, there's an inherent tension in contemporary vernacular, right? How can you be contemporary and vernacular at the same time? But this is what, this is what they're trying to do, and this is what I think critical regionalism was also, you know, thinking about, uh, and they might be very happy with Nisharab. Uh, it's not your traditional conservation. In fact, it is not conservation outside of the, of the core because the entire uh, context has been uh, erased, if you will, and recreated. So there's element of you know, contrived history. But if in any case, they've created, they've created a much more vibrant uh, space using some of these ideas of uh, regionalism and vernacularism that we're talking about. In this, in this talk. And you can see the scale of vernacular would have been something like this, right? And this scale is much different. I think the volume, they've maintained the, vol the ratio the same, but it's a different sort of, it's expanded. It's like two, two times. Uh, uh, there's another way that Qatar has done, you know, uh, is dealing with its vernacular places or everyday places, and it's a different approach. It's a more st standard preservation or conservation approach. And this is a site next to Misharab. It's uh, Souk Vakif. Uh, it's a popular traditional market in Doha, and it underwent, again, a major redevelopment project in 2000. Similar sort of arrangement, Qatar government puts in all the money, gives it to the conservation Qatar Foundation, and then they use, you know, uh, they preserve this place. So they also, unlike Misharab, here they've also preserved the historic urban form, but not all. They claim that they've only gotten rid of 33 older buildings and they've heavily restored others. But when you go through it, it seemed like overly sanitized. And, uh, and the new buildings that they put in uh, are, you know, they use traditional sort of vocabulary, so you can't distinguish them. They sort of blend in which I think also gives you a contrived sense of history. You can't tell which was old, which was new. But that's not the point, but they've essentially sort of you know, created it into a, a place for consumption by the tourists uh, and taken that place away from the locals uh, and, and created a place of spectacle, if you will, uh, and a lot of conservation effort, especially around uh, traditional architecture uh, struggles with that. We're, unable to find models where we can preserve a neighborhood just for the people without bringing in tourism, without bringing, bringing in other things. Uh, because, you know, uh, land is monetized and we live in a, a capitalist framework. We're, we don't have models where we could control for gentrification and once gentrification happens, you know, uh, how that unfolds. So here also a number of old buildings were demolished to make room for new structures. Um, uh, the Qatar Foundation argues that most of the buildings that they demolished were from 1980s and 1990s, so they were not historic in that sense. But they do agree to have demolished 19 buildings and oh, heavily uh, restored 33 others. Uh, like I said, it's a place now for the tourist gaze, consumption, uh, not quite a place for the people. Uh, a failed model, yet a model that we're replicating all over the world, because perhaps we don't know what to do with it. Perhaps the 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 idea of thinking about conservation for especially lived in places is, is, uh, uh, is ironic. Because you know, once you live in a place, you're obviously gonna transform it, right? And unless we can find meaning in those transformations and learn how to value those transformations, we're just sort of you know, uh, barking up the wrong tree, I think. Either you say, you know, it doesn't matter if your thatched roof is changed to a tin roof, it's all right, you're still vernacular. We still value you and how you sort of lived and appropriated and shaped this place, then that's great. If you're still going to be not valuing social history and completely sort of thinking about the fabric, then, then there's, and that's why I think we're still struggling with effective models to, 
to, to manage it. And very quickly, another couple of things. In China, China is also doing somewhat like Qatar, Qatar is doing. The hutongs or the alleyways in China are pre-modern urban forms. They are traditional courtyard homes lined along alleys. So these are called alley homes. They're commonly inhabited by the poor and the transient uh, and are of, uh, elite associate them with squalor, overcrowding, and social problems, a little bit like our uh, urban villages. So not going to get into the urbanism, uh, urbanization of China, which is rapid, but around uh, the Beijing Olympics in Olympics in 2000, the city and the municipal governments launched a major effort to transform these places because they didn't want the global eye to see the messy, messiness in, in the emerging uh, sort of you know, global uh, China. Uh, and, and because they were, because they were uh, situated in like the, the main city grid, they had a lot of uh, real estate value. So the city got, essentially got together with the, muni the municipalities got together with the federal government and they completely changed these uh, Hutong, Hutong homes. They did not use the Patrick Giri's methodology. They actually first erased it and then put in the infrastructure, modern infrastructure, wide roads, everything. And then they recreated this form. I don't have an image, I apologize. They recreated the Hutong form, so it really looks like it could be historic as you're walking through it. Uh, it looks like hutongs. You go in, it's a restaurant and showrooms and other things. It looks like hutong, but they're not the original hutong. And again, like Qatar, Misharab, they're a different scale. I think Misharab is more honest that it's not trying what, what uh, Beijing hutongs have been trying. They're really a pastiche and giving a sense that this could be how the hutong, hutongs were. Uh, there are a couple of examples of alternative practice that I think have value. There's a model of Hutong, develop, Hutong development called Jewer Hutong Courtyard Housing, which has demonstrated you know, new approaches to thinking about Hutongs. Uh, uh, these are the, the Jewer Hutong you know, avoided demolition. It got the community together. And there's a huge community involvement program around the Jewer uh, Hutongs. And you can, you can read about it because it's gotten multiple awards. So they bring the community together, you know, give them the, uh, treat them as stakeholders, which is very novel in China, and perhaps to some degree in India. And then they had them, you know, make policies for this place and how they reimagined its, its, uh, its repair and restoration uh, and what kind of incremental type of transformation they, they foresaw in, in this space. So it, Already got a Habitat for Humanities Award, I think, I believe in 2018. It got a, another award by the United Nations uh, for revitalizing historic communities uh, while retaining its traditional character and strong sense of community. So I urge you, if you're looking for alternative models of thinking about uh, conservation uh, or maintaining, I, I, I like the word maintaining instead of conservation of these everyday places, uh, this might be a, a good example to, to look at. Again, the Beijing Municipal Commission was involved in this uh, and lots of uh, local stakeholders. They had international funds for it, so it got uh, a kickstart. Uh, and I'll wrap up with the same block of, you know, so what do we do? I was thinking about what, how, do we, how do we think about these everyday places? Like I said, do we even need to think about managing these places? Because their, their beauty and value is in the way they evolve and change and transform, right? Uh, so why should we be thinking of micromanaging these places? Why don't we just let them be, right? That's one way of thinking about it. But then Seattle tried that, but when, when, once you let them be, given that land is monetized, and the pressure, especially in cities like Seattle and perhaps even Delhi, uh, the extreme pressures of uh, uh, transformation and growth uh, such places end up being uh, easy targets for redevelopment. So it's, uh, it's, it's not either or. There's some, there's some middle ground in which we can think about uh, these places. So this is the same neighborhood of the 500 block of pine that I talked about. It was an old manufacturing district from the late 19th century. You can see it, early 20th century. That is, uh, that is real, real deep history for Seattle because it was settled in 1850s. Uh, 
the, the colonial settlement happened in 1850s. So this is a neighborhood that had an urban form like this, you can see. It was every day, it had, auto it had automobile showrooms, it had a very basic, non-ostentatious urban form. You know? And then in 2000, the dot-com boom happens and a lot of pressure, uh, you know, uh, the city faces a lot of pressure. So what does the city do? It upzones this area. So it was zoned for ground plus one, as you can see, and some places ground plus two. It, uh, it's upzoned it to ground, ground plus five. So obvious, obviously it would bring, you know, naturally it would bring a lot of uh, uh, pressures of redevelopment in this. And what that pressure of redevelopment did was that it quickly started transforming this neighborhood from the gritty and the grungy to the genteel. Lots of rich people started moving here. So gentrification happened. Uh, and that was, you know, the 500 block of pine that I talked about was emblematic of all the problems that was happening in the neighborhood that the residents were seeing. Uh, anyway, the city created what they called a conservation district, which is not a historic district. In the U.S. context, the historic district is mandated through the, the, the federal government. So it has more teeth. Uh, and it is, you know, the zoning is implemented at the local level, but, but that is what we call, or what I call a stick model. If you are a historic district, there's, there are lots of things you cannot do. So that's one way U.S. has been thinking of preserving the everyday context, uh, urban context. So these neighborhoods don't have anything special. They just have regular, you know, they could have a regular uh, retail or a housing stock or a mix, and that they would be preserved by a local historic zoning, which means you cannot redevelop it. Any taking that occurs because of your inability to redevelop it would be compensated by the, by the government, municipal government. So let's say the zoning changes, then you cannot develop your property from one to three floors. You would be able to sell the air rights, you know, uh, and, and uh, partake in transfer of development rights to preserve that stock. Uh, what conservation districts, on the other hand, is a carrot model. It's not a stick model. It doesn't really ask you to preserve anything, con conserve anything. Although, you still have to go through a review process. So you may have to answer questions by the expert as well as the community when you're presenting your design. But the conservation district is a carrot model where it says, if you preserve historic stock, you, we will give you incentives. We'll give you more floor area ratio, right? So if, instead of going from ground to ground plus five, you could go to ground plus six. Uh, so this is, this is an example there. These are four parcels that you can see, one, two, three, four. Uh, and a developer bought this, got rid of this building, got rid of that building, uh, conserved this building to avail all the benefits, uh, and created this massing, right? So, so another form, so this is the additional floor area ratio, the incentive uh, floor area ratio that they got, and that's worth in millions in, in a city like Seattle. So that's a, sort of the incentive program that they come up, they've come up with. Lots of problems with this also around gentrification and social displacement, but I don't have time to get into it. We can talk over, over discussions, and I really want to wrap up with where do we go from here. Like I said, I don't have models that that I can, I can give you, uh, you know. But what, I, what I'm think, I was thinking about is that whatever we do, first of all, less is more. We shouldn't be doing much. But uh, any, anything that we do should strive for maintaining the authenticity of the place, right? Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a long drawn battle, if you will, but it's important to not, not give up uh, and not strive for the ideal sort of ideal conservation, make peace, you know, good, uh, best is the enemy, enemy of good, right? So people frown on this also, of course, because there was lots of historic fabric, but there's still some markers of, of history and, and place uh, and aesthetics also in, in this model. Uh, I, I want to end with Sharon uh, Zukin's, you know, uh, I'm going to quote her from her work, The Death and Life of Authentic Urban Spaces, you know. And she's in, in her book, book called The Naked City. 
and, and she's talking about, you know, that we all desire authenticity. Uh, and the longing for the past is, is very s solid and real, right? Uh, and, and it's a power, powerful force in urban life. But, but I think what we're doing is we're seeking authenticity in manufactured uh, urbanism, right? In the hutongs and the misharab. Because we're so crave it that we're fine with it. It's okay. It's not real. But we're still getting some sense of it, right? So she's saying that uh, we're, we're seeking, you know, authenticity is really, really important. And, and anything that any urban intervention should take into account the value of authenticity in a place that has evolved. Because if you're not going to do it, whatever you create would be manufactured as you saw in the case of Hutongs and Misharab. And we're we so hungry for authenticity that we still celebrate those places. If you look at them, they are very, very loved places. People are enjoying it. You can, you can say they, they're clueless, they don't know. I think they know. They just want to be part of that, that setting. And with that, I'm going to end. And we can take questions, comments, and thank you. We'd encourage uh, comments, observations to start a discussion. Any questions for him? Um, like he said, he's raising some points to just have a discussion that would be fruitful. So, anybody to start? There are many countries which are demolishing this, uh, this old properties and all. Which country, according to you, is preserving, maintaining the authenticity more? Uh, it is the same with all, the, all countries. I mean, country is a very different scale uh, to assess authenticity. It's a, I would say cities, or some cities appear to be uh, managing it better. Uh, certainly European cities have been able to do it. They've, they've maintained their everyday, his, I don't even want to use historic, everyday urban form. They've maintained it. And they've also sort of embraced continuity, like Amsterdam is a good, good example. You know, they're not controlling as to how you can live, what you can do, where you can do this. And I think that is, that's why uh, Amsterdam is not really manufactured. It is what it is. You may like it or not, but it is authentic in the way it has evolved. And uh, it's managed largely by, the core is managed largely by planning uh, and not so much by conservation uh, through zoning and other efforts. but. But it's also, you know, the parcel sizes there are so small. So what, what can you do even if you, even if there are, you know, you can't create, put high rises in, in that stock. So again, form is just, morphology is just one piece of authenticity. And I don't think it's even the biggest piece, although it's a very important piece. Uh, it's the social, it's, a, it's, it's the social, social fabric and how people have shaped that place and how those places have evolved. So I don't have an answer as to which cities do better. I'm just thinking about cities from the top of my mind that appear to be, uh, be more authentic, in, at least in some of their places in, within the fabric of the city. Hello. Do you have an uh, opinion on what's been done in Chandni Chowk, whether it's the Havelis or it's that Central Boulevard or whatever? I actually am going tomorrow to see for myself. I've, I've seen it once when it was under construction. Uh, I, I won't say I'm, I'm nervously optimistic, but I'm nervously stressed. Uh, because I, what I've read, uh, 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 my opinion would be that you know I, 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 they're taking away from the real feel of Chandni Chowk, and they're creating a, a boulevard kind of the original Chandni Chowk, but it's not quite the original Chandni Chowk. Also, like the the alley with the uh, the stream and other things. I don't know. Are they recreating a stream in between? No. So, so I don't know. It's also what I saw that in the way that they were, they were imagining it. That was last year or a year and a half ago. It seems very cookie cutter, 
some kind of standardized approach to street furniture, this, that. So it's edging into that manufactured sort of realm of urbanism. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's more functional. Maybe it, it might address some of the issues around congestion and traffic, I don't know. So there may be some benefits associated with this transformation, but I think the losses would be more uh, given what I'm, what I'm reading. So I haven't seen it for myself. I'd like to hear from those who have seen it to, to, to get their opinion. Uh, I was um, rather uh, kind of intrigued actually by your closing comment, your closing quote, because uh, I know that uh, um, I interact with people who are very delighted uh, by the absolutely um, cookie cutter, film set kind of uh, things that come up, and they're very f delighted by them. So is there a kind of dumbing down of the masses while the few powerful seem to have, who are the designers, who's in control, who has a say, where are the people, where are the people's voices? I mean, it's all very uh, mm -hmm. scary, actually. I agree, I mean, I was hearing about, somebody shared with me about the Smart City program and how, you know, heritage was a very small piece of it. And even that piece was being managed by bureaucrats. And, and conservationists could not convey to them the authenticity, even in a smart city con context. So I don't know. It's dumbing down, certainly, because if you're, if you're, I mean, again, maybe it's our elitism speaking. If people are happy with made up historic places, right? Uh, but, but I think we still have some responsibility. I, f I see us as tastemakers to some degree. I mean, cultural sh sort of, you know, tastes are built by what they see in movies, what, what they see around them, what people wear, the fashions and everything. So I think we still have some responsibility to sort of uh, give them multiple choices and then have them choose which place they find more appealing. Perhaps it's the more authentic place. But you can see what's happening with the urban villages in Delhi, right? The, the least authentic ones are getting the most press, or, or at least the ones that have transformed in ways that are, that are not that authentic. Uh, but then maybe authenticity is also not frozen in time. Maybe that also changes with time, right? Who's to say that 50 years down the line, uh, Musharraf is not historic? It would be, and we might be, like in the US, you're talking about suburbs and ways to conserve suburbs. And this is the most, at least in academic literature, suburbs are so despised and so critiqued for everything that's wrong with planning in the US. Uh, so, but then now conservationists are talking about, uh, you know, modern heritage. The, and how do, you, how do you deal with this talk that you do not really relate with or you don't have an affinity with? Right? They say conservation skips a generation. You tend to like things of your grandparents, what they do. You're more sort of interested in their lives and more patient with them than your own parents. Right? So conservation also skips a generation. So how do you, how do you think about these? And also much of modern, modernist talk was not meant to last. Their shelf life was 50 to 70 years. Right? And uh, these were mass produced, rapidly put together places, right? Uh, so it's, it's a dilemma, whether you preserve it or uh, at least preserve samplings of it so people can see what happened at this time in the urban development of this country. So, yeah. Let me ask, why this fascination is there for these glass structures? I live in Gurugram. All across there is a fascination for glass structures. I don't know. I think there's uh, many experts in the room that can answer that, but uh, I think one thing, it's imagery. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's sort of, it, it's communicating this uh, global modernity uh, that, you know, we, we've arrived, we, we can also do this, right? And uh, so there's that, there's the power and prominence and dominance in that form, the skyscape reform. And then feminist, uh, you know, feminist uh, geographers have argued that it's a phallic imagery that men have created everywhere in the landscapes, you know, just to 
sort of convey the, the, the power, the masculine power uh, in, in, in an urban scape. So that there's really no reason why we should obsess with it, right? Because there are, there are models in the country that can show that you can achieve similar densities in mid-rise, high-density form. So you really don't have to go for a, a somewhat failed model, in uh, the tower in the park model that Lee Kobuzia gives us, you know, lifting the building on pilotes and growing, freeing up the ground plane. Yes, it worked some places. It didn't work in many other places, but we, it certainly is problematic in the Indian context but because we don't, we're not ready yet or we do not want to perhaps organize our lives in vertical forms. Maybe the newer generation is. But we still sort of, you know, see great deal of uh, sort of, you know, visual power in these structures. And maybe it is, I don't know, it takes up less land. So there's economics to it. So if you were to spread out that density, you would perhaps, perhaps economics plays out. But then in the tower, tower in the park model, the land economics didn't play out because the much, much of the ground plane that was freed was also land that you had to buy and maintain. It wasn't used very much, right, because everyone had a car by that point. They didn't use the hardscape that the modernists provided for the community to come together, right? And so, uh, I don't know, somebody who knows about economics, maybe there's an economic argument for the tower, but Doshi has shown us, um, and Korea has also shown us that you can achieve high densities uh, in mid-rise, uh, compact uh, models of development, which are more in tune with the, with the climate in India and also the tr traditional ways of living, right? But then what are traditions? They're also changing. So some people may not appreciate a courtyard, especially the younger generations. So, uh, you know, the higher uh, uh, glass structures, they gave dangerous employment to the cleaners. <laughs> That I mean, look at it. He, he, I, I'm not. I don't remember the exact quote, but Korea was saying that you know, imagine the the uh, energy that one would have to use to cool up these glass towers in in the summer, long extended summer months in India, and think about climate change and how much more energy would be needed, right? So you can create a Leeds platinum tower like you're doing, but what's the point? Right, lead platinum. You know, one or two as a sample is okay, but you know all the buildings and it's all completely concrete jungle. Right, and that so, also adds to the microclimate, of course. Right. So one place we visited quite a few years back was Navalgarh in Rajasthan. So they were all uh, havelis and a uh, lot of frescoes and beautiful havelis which people were living and then they were selling them off and all again, you know, the uh, it was urbanization was taking care. Anything you can look on that? Well, that's, that has happened in the U.S. also in many, many cities like, you know, cities uh, such as New Orleans and Charleston, right? So there was a time when modernism happens and all this everyday stock is seen as redundant. People didn't want to live in those small internal spaces, they wanted bigger living rooms and all that. And suburbanization was happening, so they're just moving out and leaving the stock behind. And the cities were not able to generate enough revenue from property taxes and such, so there was lack of maintenance. So one thing led to the other. And, and, and then what happened was these, these uh, uh, architects and developers would come to these town and sort of buy these buildings and pillage them for their their artwork and ornamentation and frescoes and building elements like pillars and stuff, right? And that also is happening, some, some of that is happening in India as well, that, you know, okay, we want to bring this interesting jiroka to Delhi, right? And you just, you know, it's your, it's your privilege and your power of uh, resources that sort of allows you to do that, to bring it to a different context. And a lot of that happened until the government sort of, municipalities made that illegal to transfer building elements from, from a local region to another region. And that sort of slowed it down. Uh, and I've seen that even in Delhi interiors. You can clearly see that these elements have been brought from somewhere else, some, some living place. Uh, so. so even I had uh, 
two handles from some Haveli, I don't even know, bought from some shop. <laughs> yeah, there's a huge, huge market for that, right? That's again 20 years back, 22 years back. Yeah, it might have some value now. <laughs> Hello, and thank you so much for the nice lecture. Uh, I've been working as a communication coordinator in the development sector for some years, and I realized that there is some, you know, some destruction or some gap in the social and the cultural uh, structure of India and maybe all around the world as well. And we see that, you know, that there's a quantum of money involved in, you know, in infrastructure, in buildings and highways. And people had to move from one place to another. And there's a loss of culture and their own society. And then there are examples of, you know, of Havelis in Shah Jahanabad or even Shahpur Jat and other places. So I can thoroughly relate that, you know, why authenticity is important because I've seen kids and youth members bringing change in their own communities with their own small initiatives, though they cannot be served to, you know, to masses in frames on Instagram or any in, on newspapers mm. or in any media houses, but still they are bringing changes. But uh, I still do not understand that why this deprivation or gap is happening and that too, you know, it is one way and I don't find it democratic enough where, you know, where people are made enable to make their own choices and they are felt in a way that they cannot make changes in their own spaces and in their own lives. Oh, yeah. So I have felt this and I acknowledged it through your um, lecture as well. So. I obviously rely on the point that authenticity is important and then there is this, you know, this huge discussions on sustainability and ownership of the stakeholders, of the community stakeholders. And architecture obviously plays a big role in it, but it takes time because, and nobody has time, everybody is rushing in creating buildings and doing a lot of things. So uh, I just need to analyze this thing as like, people in the house mentioned about Havelis in Shah Jahanabad. I belong to that place. And yes, there are some Havelis that have been taken and still the normal people, the ordinary people can, do not have access to it, who used to live over there. And there are people who belong, who do, who do not actually belong to that area. They are enjoying that place. And there are, there are people who actually belong to that place are restricted to enter that place. Right, right. So, uh, it's, you know, this, there's a new book that argues that how gentrification kills the city, right? Because, I mean, the cities are being shaped in the vision of the elite, right? What they value, how they see patterns of urban development, the, 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 the stock they place in high-rise and global modernity. Uh, and it's, it's really, uh, you know, not an inclusive city, and 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 they're like I said, the 21st century city world over is the most unjust city. Like we thought about, you know, the de the the class divides that happened during industrialization, right? Those were sort of framed as majorly inequitable because you know the wealth was ended up in few hands, and then the rest of the masses were working working in the industries, right? So, 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 so the the point is that, and we're we're still sort of you know we're we're furthering that narrative of of cities for the elite, uh, and without you know thinking about the consequences of our intervention in historic fabrics like Haveli, right? We and we can't just uh, sort of pretend ignorance. We you know it's not an uh, it's not a consequence that you, you didn't think about and you say, ah, I did this and it brought a lot of people. You already know that what you're going to do is going to transform this neighborhood. And it's all, in many ways, it's deliberate and also, also desired, right? So you're going in uh, with that intention. So the, I, I don't, I, I, I hear you and I've seen it, 
Do I have answers for it? No, uh, there are no answers, right? How do you, we don't have mechanisms to value social history. We don't have mechanisms to preserve use, right? Like if there's a very nice small uh, ether store, right? And you can't say that you have to remain an ether store for the rest of your life because you can't legislate use. You could just say, this building, perhaps you can preserve it. You can say, okay, this building won't change because of your use as well as the form of the building. But you can't say the ether store, ether store should remain as is. So we don't, we don't have tools for that. But then should we also be having tools for that? What would, how does it matter if that ether store becomes a, a local, you know, yeah. So, yeah, so I don't know. So these are, these are I mean, in, in US we're struggling with that. Because much of the value in this neighborhood, these everyday neighborhoods that I talk about, are coming from use, not from the building, right? It's that bakery, it's that restaurant in San Francisco's battery district, right, that everyone's going. So how do you, and you can't legislate use. So now they've started a heritage, uh, a legacy business program. So that's another tool they're trying to use, where they incentivize the the, the owners to maintain that use. Uh, because they've seen that, you know, there's a lot of intangible that's sort of knitted with the, uh, with the stock here that you see, right? And if you're not going to be thinking about these intangibles, then tangibles alone would not work as much as you would expect them to. And it's also putting too much pressure on them, right? So you have to think about multiple ways in which you could, again, not preserve, but maintain these businesses and maintain the form. Uh, so the legacy business program is one, one way that they're doing it. But, but yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Do you? Right. Right, right, right. right. Do you see these intangible things, uh, you know, taken into consideration and inclusiveness, like around five days down, five years down the line, or ten years down the line? In India, I, 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 I'm not sure about that because you know there's a robust. I, I'm coming from Seattle, which has a robust public participation process. It took them like 15 years to get their first line of the metro going. Before that, Delhi had, Delhi had created four lines in that time frame, right? So participatory democracy is expensive and time consuming. Uh, so I see that happening in other parts of the world where you can stall these projects. There's, a, there's some mechanism through which community engagement is not what you see here happening around slum redevelopment. It's not somebody coming in and sharing the drawings with the slum residents and, and going. That is community engagement. Dikha diya, ho gaya, chalo. It's a, it's a different kind of process where the minutes are noted, everybody is discussed and synthesized, and then it goes into the public domain for comments. So that takes a lot of time and effort. But you could say that that's also a factor of a, of, of a culture that has, that, is, that has more time, right? Because they're, they're so invested in public affairs that because they, they have more time and uh, some cultures simply don't can't afford that much time, right? So, so do I see that happening in India? Uh, that robust public uh, sort of participation around heritage? I, I would hope so, maybe in the next 10 years, where people you're saying, you know, there are examples where people have taken things in their own hands and trying to do things. And maybe these models are not perfect. Maybe they don't, maybe the outcomes that are delivering, we as professionals might frown on, but, but at least they're, they're homegrown and they're, they're testing it out. The UN has started, you know, in, in the least developed countries of the world, of India is not part of it, they sort of have a program around heritage and culture where, where they, they're bringing in global monies to pay the youth in sort of working in the area of, uh, of cult cultural development and heritage uh, preservation. So because of growing joblessness, so you can sign up and say, okay, I'll help out with this, you know, and then you get a training and then you get paid for that. So they're a little bit like what uh, Nanda was doing here in, 
Yeah, in Nizamuddin village, right? So a bit like that. So there are different models in which community, I mean, the, I, I, the Nizamuddin village might be a decent example of community engagement. It's in the Indian context, it is. It's a little paternalistic and top down, but still is, right? You're, you're training people. I mean, the role is more subservient, but it still sort of, you know, generates livelihoods and improves their living condition. And heritage is just a small piece in a much larger gamut of urbanism, which is how it should be, I think. So I like that model, especially for everyday informal places. Thank you for the discussion and uh, putting up so many observations. Uh, I'd like to request uh, Mr. Divigupta and Professor Ajitre together to just give a small token of appreciation <coughs> to our speaker, please. Together. Come, come, sir. Pranam Guruji. I was, I was trained by him. <laughs> He's saying, I don't want to be associated with that. I didn't train him. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Happy to see you grow up. Yeah. I was, you were my age when I was in your classes, perhaps, right? Or, or younger. 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 Yeah, we look like contemporaries. Yeah, but I, I don't have the I don't have the wisdom that you have, but yeah. Thank you for recognizing. You're wiser than I didn't know. <laughs> you are wise. You've always known that. <laughs> thank you. So I have a handful of people to thank uh, who put this together and helped uh, each bit of it. Just uh, lend me five more minutes or maybe three. Um, I'm Malvika from Architectural Heritage Division, and on behalf of uh, Intac, I thank. Professor Manish Chalana for sharing his wisdom and uh, for uh, collating all your various experiences into this short talk for us. Thank you. Um, and AH Intac would uh, like to thank uh, our chairman and member secretary who attended most of the mm -hmm. talk and uh, who uh, encourage us for all these endeavors and uh, dissemination activities and research proposals which uh, germinate into these talks. And um, we're ha very happy to see uh, the audience in person uh, because we've been having online talks for a long while and uh, you know, it's happy to be, we are happy to be back in person. And uh, if any of you did not receive an email from us, uh, please sign up uh, in our register um, at the reception because we'd love to keep you posted for future events. And. Um, we are also grateful to the members of our advisory committee at Architectural Heritage Division who give us a huge amount of support to uh, you know, ideate such activities and uh, go forward with them. And highly appreciate um, Mr. Deve Gupta's uh, conceptualizing such studies like uh, our pioneering state of built heritage and flagship projects like architectural styles. Um, which germinate into, I mean, I've used the word germinate, <laughs> uh, which actually lead us to such talks. Uh, you are one of our resources. Uh, this is the 11th talk in the series. Um, and each of them have been resources for the um, research that we're conducting on styles. And um, our uh, HOD, uh, Ms. A. Vijaya, who's sitting right in the corner, but um, who supports and give us, gives us the much needed impetus for uh, carrying such forward. And um, we're thankful to Professor Rajatri, who actually is the advisor for this styles project and gave us a wide framework to work with and such a complex uh, sort of topic. And none of this would be possible without the intact admin team and the admin team at AH itself. Uh, you know, to put this all together. And so we're thankful to each and every one of them. And um, also the Intact Cultural Affairs Division for spreading the word, uh, sending out mailers. And uh, 
this uh, event was put together uh, by a small team of architects and conservation architects at uh, Architectural Heritage Division Intac. I'd like to particularly thank uh, Kushar Gragrawal and Musharrafa for taking care of the minute details. And um, thank you all really for staying and uh, you know, giving us the encouragement. Please join us for refreshments and tea. Um, and we look forward to the next event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.